Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. And people who like science, it's very natural, often also enjoy science fiction. We like to think that science fiction is the literature of ideas, right? That science fiction takes us places, puts human beings in situations where ordinary fiction, which is constrained by reality, uh, might not let us go. So there's opportunities within science fiction to ask questions and to examine existing questions in ways that would otherwise not be possible. So today we have an interesting angle in the science fiction universe. We're talking to Seth MacFarlane, the actor, director, writer, who is famous for, of course, things like Family Guy, the animated show, movies like Ted and Once Upon a Time in the West. And Seth also has albums. He's a singer and arranger of music. But the project that he's working on that I'm most interested for this conversation is The Orville. This is, a, as you might know, science fiction TV show that appears on Fox. It just completed its second season. Third season will be upcoming. And it's basically Star Trek with uh, some comedic touches. I think in the early days, people were a little confused about what The Orville was supposed to be. It had dramatic elements and comedic elements. And it, it took about half a season, I would say, in season one to find its feet, really. But now, to be honest, uh, not just because Seth is on the show, I think this is one of the most interesting TV shows out there. They are really using the medium of science fiction to talk about issues that are very, very relevant to us here on Earth right now. So that's what uh, Seth agreed to talk about, and we had a very interesting, thoughtful discussion about how you come up with these scenarios, how they do relate to what's going here on Earth, you know, how the real world cannot help but affect your science fictional drama that you're writing, and hopefully backwards, how thinking about these new things in a science fictional setting can give us new handles on the problems we have here on Earth. So I think it was a very rewarding conversation. Uh, and also, you know, the first thing that comes up and everyone admits it's true is that Seth has a really wonderful voice for radio or podcasts. So that's always, always makes it a pleasant experience. Uh, I think you're gonna like this one. Let's go. Seth McFarland, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you very much. So you seem to be able to keep busy. <laughs> you seem to have a lot going on. Uh, I know you have had TV shows and movies, various forms of talk talking animals and talking stuffed animals. But I really wanted to concentrate on The Orville, the this science fiction show, which uh, I've become a big fan of. Why don't we say what the show is for the few of us in the audience who don't know? Um you know, the, sh the show is is kind of a classic style episodic sci-fi adventure series that um, that that sort of a, adheres to the traditional sci-fi method of storytelling, which is to take elements of our society, you know, whether it be social or political or or scientific, and and find ways to tell stories about those things in an allegorical fashion through the lens of sci-fi. Um, and, you know, for me, I, I grew up with, with, uh, episodic sci-fi. I grew up with things like the Twilight Zone and obviously Star Trek and, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I miss that style of storytelling, in which I was, I could see a self-contained show that was based around an idea as opposed to a twist. Hmm. And I, I think in the age of, Oh, that's a good way of putting it. Like what, so what, well, in the, in the age of streaming shows where you're dealing with a story arc that lasts throughout the season, it's kind of hard to to explore a lot of different uh, areas of, of it's 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 hard to tell the 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 diversity of stories yeah. becomes less in that format, and uh, it starts to become about how can I surprise the audience with a crazy twist rather than what used to be the case is, is how what new idea can I present to the audience this week? Uh, and you really can only do that with self-contained stories, I think. Yeah, and certainly I'm a big fan of a lot of the uh, you know cable prestige drama long series, mm -hmm. but there's absolutely a place. But for, that's all we're getting now. I know exactly. That's and the problem. I miss you know procedurals yeah. and monsters of the week and, and yeah. whatever. Yeah, I mean it's 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 nice to you know one of the mission statements of the Orville is that is that. You know, within reason, you know, we do like to reward our fans for 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 sticking with us, but it also should be something where 
you don't have to commit to an entire season right off the bat if you don't want to. You can watch one hour and we'll tell you a story that doesn't require you to have followed every soap opera twist that's come before it. And and that's, you know, I, you, there, you, there's nothing, there's no television show you can watch now where the first episode doesn't insist that you stick around for the next yeah. eight or 13. And it's like, who the <laughs> hell has that off, kind of time? Yeah. <laughs> Does it create pressure on you or the writers to go up with a new plot every week? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a different kind of, you know, obviously, to 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 map out a serialized arc throughout the course of a season is is a lot of work. But I do think that at the end of the day, that's that's a that's one idea that you're. It's one story that you're telling over the course of eight or ten episodes. To come up with a brand new idea every week, you know, I, it, it's it. I have such renewed respect for guys like Serling, who, <laughs> particularly at a time when there was no nothing to really there was no template to work from. He had to reinvent the wheel um, that he was able to bring a brand new idea every week. Yeah. And, and not just for 13 for 22. And the twilight zone was obviously one of the inspirations, even more obviously star Trek was an inspiration. So let's just tell the audience, you have a spaceship, you're on the bridge, there's yeah. aliens. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting that the, the, the idea of a, what is in effect a naval ship, in space rather than on the waters is something that's been around since, I mean, it's probably, I, I probably since before the 1930s, but obviously in film, that seems to be where, where it, it, it emerged in the most memorable way with the serialized, um, films that, that, that come from that era, you know, Star Trek was the first franchise to really solidify it as a, as a, you know, kind of work out the kinks. Mm. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, you watch Star Wars or Buck Rogers or these subsequent shows, and they're all kind of taking cues from the original Star Trek. I mean, you know, when Star Wars uses the term cloaking device, it it's, you know, that's something that they got from from uh, Star Trek. Star Trek dreams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hotel Tractor torpedoes. Beams, absolutely, yeah. They just, they, you know, they, they, they There's wrote... There's a toolbox there. They wrote the book for, for all of us, and it's really just how you want to use it. And, you know, I think for us, if... If the Star Trek franchise was doing that particular thing at this point in time, then there there might not be a place for the Orville. Mm. But because they're not, they're they're they've gone more of the streaming serialized direction. It's left this big wide opening that we've been able to step into with our show, and it's and you know we've been having a blast. So I take it you were a Star Trek fan growing up. Were you a science fiction fan? In general? I was. Yeah, yeah, and I wasn't. I, I was kind of picky and choosy about the sci-fi that I, I never really got into Blade Runner, or Battlestar mm. Galactica, or these kind of hard sci-fi. I really, <clears throat> I was a big fan of Star Trek, big fan of the Twilight Zone. Um, you know, I, I, I enjoyed some Ray, Ray Bradbury. Mm -hmm. Some of it got a little too heady for me when I was a kid. <laughs> um, <laughs> a little, so you're, little it was reading as well as uh, TV movies. Yeah, yeah. I used to. I, you know, I, was, I was a Heinlein guy myself mm -hmm, at, mm -hmm. at that age, but you know, also Asimov well, and Sturgeon and Zelazny. Yeah, Stur Sturgeon. It's interesting. I, I, I bought a collection of his short stories, and they're really out there. They're then. It's interesting. There's a lot of comedy in his writing. It's a lot of mix mixing sci-fi and comedy, and and some of them are. Some of them are, are very much of their time, but others are, are you know, have these little snippets of wisdom <laughs> that, that are applicable to ours. Did you, how long have you been thinking about doing a sci-fi show? You know, I, uh, for some time, I, I, this, this show was, um, th this show emerged, originally the Orville was going to be a, a, uh, I'd written it as sort of a, a feature idea. Oh. Um, and then very quickly, decided no this is there's nothing like this on tv right now um it was the, the initial version of it was very comedy heavy okay. and when i look back at it i i realized that that wasn't really the show that i wanted to do um that since we've kind of veered <clears throat> we've taken that pressure off ourselves and veered more towards into veered more towards um traditional science fiction without the pressure of having to have that comedy frosting on it to such a degree, I've been having a lot more fun. Hmm. I, I've realized this is, it, it's, I mean, even more so than writing family guy, it just comes, it just comes flowing out. It's, 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 
it's easier. So maybe I never should have been a comedy writer in the first place. <laughs> we discover ourselves. Yeah. We're young. Um, We're not done yet. Yeah, but it's it's. I mean, it's it's a blast. It's it's. Uh, um. And it, and it's gratifying to see that people were fans were willing to willing and ready and in many cases eager to see that from us. I, I think a lot of it initially was fear that no one would take me seriously if I wrote a sci-fi show. Mm. Um, and uh, it, it, it's I've been pleasantly disproven. Well, I thought it was very interesting, uh, the initial reaction to the show. Yeah. Um, not just what it was, but from whom? The if, if I'm getting it correctly, like if you go onto the professional critics season one mm -hmm. reviews, they were not good. Yeah. But the audience loved it. Yeah. And season two, it's caught up, right? They, and part it, of that was I, that the evolution of the show, or do we have to educate them? I think I think some of it was the evolution of the show. I think I think the the, the minority of the the uh, smaller portion was the evolution of the show. I don't think the show changed that much. Because we did one of the th one of the episodes we did show the critics initially was the about a girl episode about Bordas's baby. That's a big one, yeah. Um, and that that gets pretty, you know, for season one that gets pretty, uh, pretty dark. Intense, and, yeah. And they were, I I think what happened was it took them a minute to realize that we weren't trying to do the serialized uh, format that everyone else is doing, and and that we were. You know, the whole point was to let the story dictate the tone. Um, and I mean, look, on the original Star Trek, you see a lot of that. There's there, there, there's there are episodes that are very dark, very dramatic. There are episodes that feel more like a comedy and trouble with triples. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, you know, I, I see it as uh, I mean, look, life is that way. You, you yeah. have one day where it's your birthday and you fall in the swimming pool by accident. And another day where you lose a family member. And it's it's those are those days have very different tones and, and it's all the same life, but it feels very different. And there's television, you know, television can reflect that. And and if the characters have to be consistent and there, ha there has they have to be your anchor. But beyond that, I, th I think there's there's no reason that the story can't dictate what the tone is if, if you're telling an episodic story that's self-contained. And I think that's what threw the critics, I think, with. With three episodes, they they felt like this thing was disjointed. Um, and look, I mean, I, I for for whatever reason, you know, when I they always come out swinging when I do something <laughs> new. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> there's a yeah. little bit of that. Well, like, there's uh, a little bit of the reviews being written before the thing came out. But but I was I was I don't know. You know, it's, you, you try to ignore it, but at the same time, it's gratifying when you see that nice big fat round tomato and that 100. percent that's right. That does feel good. I don't hate it. <laughs> you do read the comments, in other words. I, I have my yeah. little podcast, and I try not to. But uh, yeah, I, I, it's, it's I, a social thing that it, we're doing. Yeah, it's it's for for television. It's it's and I imagine yeah for a podcast as well. I imagine like you're you're doing something for an audience, so there is yeah, a partnership you between you and the audience. Um, you know, with and, I mean, and I mean most of a it, lot of what way, you do though is, is science based, right? Uh, on the podcast. It's, not it's, not quite fifty percent, less yeah, than fifty yeah. percent. But because uh, that's that's where it gets dicey. Is that you 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 know this this idea that you know can't we all just have different opinions? Well, oh, you yeah. can on this, but not really on that. Um, you know, with entertainment, with something like the Orville, it's 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 very. You know, I, I'm very curious. I read as much as I can. I mean, I read. It's sometimes it's torture, but you know, I'll read Reddit. I'll read YouTube comments. I'll read Twitter. I'll read Instagram. You know, I'll I'll just get as much information as I can. Just just a because it's it's fun to see people talking about it, and sci-fi fans are so passionate about mm -hmm. you know about what they like and what they don't like, and and it's you try to balance it between your own vision of where you want the show to go and what it is they want to see because and, and I think if you can thread that needle, uh, you're you're doing something right. I, th I think I think you can't let them guide you completely, but at the no. same time you can't ignore them. But you can them. learn something like they're not idiots. Yeah. All of them, right? No, so. no, it's, no, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's interesting. The, the Isaac two parter that we did our second season was something that was a big question mark for us. We had, it was dark and it was big and it was pure sci-fi. And I, I, I had no idea whether people were going to, um, whether people were going to, uh, respond to that or not. And they not only they respond to it, it was the most popular, Mm -hmm. set of episodes to date for the series and 
the rest of that season kind of put the Isaac story on hold because we had written them all in advance and I didn't realize it was ah. going to be that successful. So, but I, you know, reading as much of what I did online, I, I discovered, oh, people want to know what the aftermath of this is. And so we, you know, I'm, I came back, I'm, I, I hear them and we're, we're dealing with that in season three. And probably when the show first came out, there were expectations, right? Like you're a comedy writer. Yeah. I think some of the marketing made it look more like Galaxy Quest Very or a much. parody show, yeah. right? And then people were a little. It's a lot of fear. It was a lot think. of fear on both sides. Uh, on on the and and I think the second season marketing piece that that Fox did was terrific. Like I really thought they did a great job. The first season, you know, on their from their end and from my end, there was some fear. You know, it, it's. It's and you know, I look. I credit John Favreau for for being my conscience when he directed the pilot, and mm-hmm. he he pointed out to me on a number of occasions, you know, you have this joke here, and I feel like you're you're disrupting what is a really good scene. Like yeah. he, he said, trust you should trust that what you have here, I, I'm I'm in I'm into it. I read this script and 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 I I didn't put it down. Like I wanted to know what happened. I was in it. I like the story. The story works and, and you don't need the crutch of all these jokes. And that was from, you know, I, I respect him enormously. And so to hear that was kind of the first step toward me making the realization that, uh, all right, maybe maybe I can do this show that I really wanted to. And, yeah. and, and I don't have to pack it with pies in the face and people will still watch. And yeah, I think it is. It seems to evolve to a place where uh, it, it's different than a typical sci-fi serialized or, or ep- even episodic show because of the jokes, but it's still story and character and setting based. Yeah. And, and, and the jokes, the jokes tell you where they want to appear. I mean, the, the, you know, the two parter with Isaac was virtually, I mean, there's a couple jokes in there, but that's about it. And, and it was, you know, where they, where they show up these days is, you know, it just comes more from the casualization of life on board a spaceship rather than hard jokes. It's just the behavior of the characters. It's a little more realistic in yeah. some sense, yeah. right? People and aren't it, not quite as stiff as you might see yeah. in the TV yeah, well, shows. Yeah. And, it, and, it ha- and it has to be for it's, – it's a tricky line to walk because you want people to care about what happens. You want to be able to tell a story with big stakes like we did in, in Identity. Um, and oftentimes that means giving up the – the shtick. I mean, it's like if you, if this is serious, your characters have to treat yeah. it seriously, and you just got to embrace that. And and so it was nice that the audience went along with us there. And there's also um, another slightly different thing that you, that we don't have in Star Trek is you know your ex wife is your yeah. second in command, and there's yeah. a lot more of the personal lives of yeah. the characters, a lot more socializing. Yeah. Well, those that that's that's the part of science fiction that I don't see enough of. I I loved. Um, you know, it's no secret. I loved uh, the Next Generation for their, among other things, for their their uh, production design. It was like it 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 always made sense to me that if you were in space for that amount of time, you would have to live somewhere that was comfortable. They had a bar. That was a huge yeah, upgrade over the original a, Star Trek. <laughs> it was like the sci fi version of like the apartment on Friends. Yeah, you wanted to be there every week. You wanted to go back, and and that's something that is that is absolutely absent from science fiction today all across the board everything is grim and dark and it looks like you're on a submarine and it's it's cool to look at but it's just it just doesn't it's not a place that you want to live in yeah it seems a little bit less human i know what you mean yeah, but and, uh, and again there's a place for it but there's also a place mm-hmm. for this uh slightly lighter yeah i, I just I, I i think i think you should be able to on a good sci-fi show you you should be able to accommodate all of yeah. it you know there's <clears throat> there's there's your characters should be strong enough that even if there's no sci-fi plot you should be able to tell Still a dramatic story. story that week that just cover that just deals with their lives so when you started planning out the show i presumably you had the idea there would be a starship there would be a crew some of them would be aliens mm-hmm. like how much was it fun or kind of torture to sit down and go all right what are the alien races how are they different um a, a little a little bit that's it's because there's so much science fiction now, it's hard to find low hanging fruit has been picked. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to find things that haven't been uh, that haven't been dealt with. As you go and as you, as you start to to um, break your stories for the series, what's nice about it is those races kind of pop up in in the in the midst of. I mean, look, it's for both the Simpsons and Family Guy. 
it happened with our our characters. You know, I I, I remember asking, God, was it um, Greg Daniels who used to run King of the Hill? Used to, I think wrote on The Simpsons like where where did all these characters come from? This populace of characters in Springfield, and he said, you know, they just kind of they just kind of popped up as we went along. Mm. Like it, some a character would emerge in the middle of a story and. Like, oh, that's good. We need yeah, it'd be a funny character. That. So let's make that person a part of the town. And eventually the same thing happened with Family Guy. These characters popped up as we were telling these stories. And, you know, with the Orville, uh, it's been it's been the same. The, the, we will tell a story and and um, an alien race will emerge as as part of the narrative and it works. And so we keep them around. Let's pause for a minute to talk about The Great Courses Plus. I'm really happy that for the very first advertisements we have here on Mindscape, I get to talk about a product I truly believe in. The Great Courses provide accessible, college-level video and audio courses in a wide variety of subjects, from physics to history to music and much more. I've done three different courses with them myself, and I can vouch for the fact that there is a rigorous selection process. It's not just that anyone can go and be a professor for The Great Courses. You have to audition, and you can fail, the audition. So you're guaranteed when you get these courses to get teachers who love teaching and who are experts in what they're talking about. And The Great Courses Plus is a streaming service. So you can watch or listen wherever you want at your convenience, either from your own computer or with The Great Courses Plus app on your mobile device. Let me also mention my own course, The Mysteries of Modern Physics Time. That's 24 half-hour lectures about all the different aspects of time, from physics to philosophy, cosmology, even the psychology and neuroscience of time. And for Mindscape listeners, they have a special offer. If you go to this URL, you can get an entire month for free. So you can start your free month right now by going to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Mindscape. That's the greatcoursesplus.com slash Mindscape. Happy learning. So there are, it seems extremely explicit, at least to me, that you are taking advantage of the idea that science fiction can comment on our current state, you know, yeah. our current problems in various ways. You want to mention some of your favorite? I have a long list here of different things you've done, but. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, that, yeah, that's 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 a broad question. You mean on other series or uh, what, what, as far as no, what on the done? Orville, what I'm yeah. thinking of is, you know, um, the the obvious example is Bordas when he basically develops mm-hmm. a porn addiction. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> On what is the equivalent of the holodeck? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, like that was not an alien worry. That's that's a very human worry. No, it's 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 yeah. I think that's I think that episode was the only time we ever got a standards note <laughs> <laughs> in the history of the show. Which, by the way, is it, it's that's pretty good. It's for for me to have that experience. Yeah. It's like it's like oh, that's right. There's a broadcast standards <laughs> department. I, I mean, we never hear from them. Um, I mean, it's ironic that I. I have one show that's been virtually condemned by the Parents Television Council and another that's been roundly endorsed. I'm not sure how many people can you say know? that in their career. But yeah, you know, that that was an episode that, that um, yeah, I mean, just, you know, it dealt with the psychology of, of you know, look, I mean, in the, in the age of the internet, when you're walking around with a little, you know, device in your pocket that can access, you know, naked pictures 24 hours a day and uh, i mean that's 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 going to affect relationships that's yeah. that's going to really fuck with people's heads and and um it, it it's it's there there has to be some kind of fallout for that and and it's I, that that may be a little bit i, I probably sound like a a, a, a conservative <laughs> with that that <laughs> well that idea. was pretty but, you know, yeah, yeah yeah i mean there, there has to there be are issues yeah it doesn't mean ban it, right? It doesn't mean don't let it happen, but we should face up to the changing realities yeah, of I mean, how we you, you interact just, with you these things. You just have to be aware of of how of, of what your relationship is with technology. And I mean, Twitter is the best example. We're all on Twitter. I mean, I, I fucking hate it. Mm-hmm. I don't know about you. You're, I, I kind of love it. I really you, do. You do. I do. Yeah. I mean, um, I block people a lot. Yeah, and that's what but, makes is, it but isn't that a tricky thing? Because it's it's I I, I used to do that. I still do it from time to time, just because I I don't want to deal with it, but. It's almost like a, a people take it as a as a tacit acknowledgement. Yeah, no, they that yeah they wear it as a badge of honor, and it's like, well, you don't really want to give them that. You know, let them have their victories. <laughs> I, I I thought that for a long time. I muted people who I didn't yeah. like, and what I, what convinced me was friends who said, if you mute somebody, then the rest of the people reading the comments on your 
tweets still hear them. Only yeah. you miss them. Whereas if you block them, then they just can't interact. Right. And uh, it, Twitter is a weird thing because you're broadcasting to everybody. Do you think right? there's any? Do you think there's any positive uh, at this point? In t- you know, I think initially, obviously, Twitter was this charming little little uh, platform that that was new and fun, and we you know we would each write a joke yeah, every day. It was funny, yeah. <laughs> um, do you do you think there's any upside to Twitter? At this point in time, I invited you at this podcast over Twitter. <laughs> okay, well, beyond that, <laughs> <laughs> no, I've made good friends over Twitter. Like I have, uh, I've met people who I otherwise wouldn't have met. Um, people who become friends in real life. Uh, I, I learn about things. I can follow people. I was just joking with this or talking with a friend of mine last night about this. I tried really hard to follow a bunch of conservatives yeah. on Twitter, and I found that the only ones who I could really like follow without degrading my my uh, state of mind were ones who hated Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there are, yeah. there are those you know, uh, principled yeah. conservatives, but the, then there's a whole swamp out there of crazy people who yeah. I try hard to avoid. Yeah, yeah, it, I mean, it, it is tricky because I have, you know, I have a lot of liberal friends. Obviously, I live in Hollywood. I, I do have a fair number of conservative mm-hmm. friends, and and you know, yeah, there is a difference between your conservative friend who votes for Mitt Romney and your conservative friend who votes for Donald Trump. Like that, <laughs> that's a, those are two different types of people. Um, maybe maybe there's more crossover than we'd like to think, and yeah. I try to not let that keep me up at night. Well, I think you know, Twitter is. Uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook and all these things, we're just in the beginning, right? There's a technology that's changing everything. I, I do believe that we're going to have implants in our heads before too long that will let us do this without the intermediary of the phone. And there's lots yeah. of science fiction uh, and stories And it's interesting. That there, is, there, there, there is a fear. That I, I, I'm actually somebody who does not subscribe to the fear that I, – I, I think this – as much as I grouse about Twitter and, and the, the, these are the early forms of this technology, I, I – you know, I do think there's a lot of, at the moment, destructive power that they seem to have much more so than 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 constructive. But yeah, I don't know. You, you, you look at <laughs> you, you talk about implants in your head. I mean, you look at something like evolution, which has you know is is real. Let's yeah. just establish that. It's but an is, official mindscape position that evolution this is real. Staggering, you know, brainless, moronic thing that makes its way through the through the millennia. Having no you know, and, and and stumbles on us by yeah. accident. Yeah. Like at a certain point, you do kind of think to yourself, "Boy, we could do a better job." <laughs> and yeah. I and, and there's a dystopian and we're there's a dystopian onus that goes along trying. with that. Yes. And I don't. Th- and I think that it's time to kind of maybe revisit that idea because if if you could, I mean, God, I mean, if 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 you could just tweak some things in the human body that that that. That uh, you know, my God, look at look at eating. Yeah, it's it's, like it's your body. It's just evolution right. still <laughs> thinks that I'm out there with a spear in my hand trying to hunt a boar. Yeah, it doesn't realize that no, there's like a McDonald's right there. Well, I think that that's the thing because <laughs> we focus a lot on AI and computers, yeah. but I think that the uh, making human beings yeah. more automated and changing them, editing them. I've, I've talked on the podcast with synthetic biologists who are building cells from scratch. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, that's it's. We're, that's why I say we're just at the beginning of what these changes are going to take. And think about really, I mean, how different is that from using a drug to save your life if you have, you know, if you have a, an infection? In some sense, it's not right. But then, so the thought experiment is: Well, what if I invent a drug that just makes you happy all the time, but you never leave your chair? Is that an improvement in your life or not? I think it's called Jack Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> you have to leave some. Um, yeah, no, that's that, and that's yeah, that that is a that's a concern. Yeah, brave new world. We're gonna yeah. be seeing some, and I and I'm a huge believer that science fiction helps us just go a little bit toward thinking these things through ahead of time. Yeah, that's well, that's 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 a big job then. <laughs> so Bordis, uh, for those who have not seen the show, Bordis and Clyden are members of this race, the Mocklin, and there there are we're told there are only men, only male Mocklins, but they managed to give birth somehow. Uh, which makes me think that they're really only female Mocklins, but so I'm not quite sure what the definition of male think, or female is. I think is. we've, I think we've, you know, we've we've struggled that a little bit. The the, the the storytelling value that that species gives you, as opposed to the logic of the biology, what we've kind of landed on is all right. Their definitions are a little different than what ours are. They're very masculine presenting, yeah. right? They, yeah. They're they're pretty macho. <laughs> um, because it, you know, it is it is. Uh, 
at the, at the end of the day, you can always fall back on it. Well, they're aliens. It's different. That's right. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 a it's an interesting. Um, it, it was a dynamic that I hadn't seen before. These these two very stoic, you know, kind of classically science fiction aliens um, who were who you know who were, who were a pair who were mates. And, yeah, and. and <laughs> <laughs> and have this kind of domestic life going on. And it's, it's, I mean, those two actors are just gold. I mean, Chad, uh, fantastic job. Chad Coleman, who I think also does the expanse. Um, Oh and, yeah. He was Cuddy on the wire. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, Peter Macon obviously is bored us are, are they're, I mean, they're my favorite couple on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can endorse that. I, yeah. I, you could do a lot worse, but then, so uh, I'm going to mention in the introduction that we're spoiling everything. So that's okay. But, um, they have a child. It yeah. is female. Mm-hmm. This is a scandal. Uh, mm-hmm. and the cultural expectation is that there will be a sex change to turn it into a boy. Yeah. And I mean, that is heavy stuff to be tackling right there in season one. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's what, what always fascinated me was, and again, the, the, the specifics of that episode and that conflict are are arguably less pertinent than the um, than the more general conflict that's that's at play in there. And that's if you have another culture that does things their own way, that doesn't doesn't stack up with your morals and your code of ethics, but it's still their culture. At what point do you? Um, at what point do you respect their mm-hmm. ways, and at what point does that get so insane that you can't justify it in your own mind, or, or, uh, or, or, or live with yourself, and it becomes time to be galaxy police? <laughs> and Claire, I guess, is the doctor, and she yeah. originally. She, so her question was: She is also one of the treasures of the show. By oh, the she's way. great. That actress great. is amazing. Yeah. Um, she wanted to know, you know, is was it? She she worked through the ethical uh, dilemma here. You know yeah. who is benefiting from this? Is it medically necessary, or is this just a cultural thing? And yeah. I don't think there's obvious answers to these questions. Th- those are my favorite kinds of stories. Like I, I, and look as much as much as I love, as much as I think there is a there is an absence in television of noble people who just want to do the right thing. Everyone's an anti-hero, and I, I do miss the simplicity of you know Gary Cooper saying damn it i just got married but i gotta turn around and go fight this bad guy (laughs) i I do think that that's that's not a good thing that that doesn't exist on on television that that i i when i was a kid i had you know it was fiction but there were people like you know picard and it was it was you know people who were people who uh were just out to do you know even the superheroes Super friends, for God's sake. They were so <laughs> wholesome. But these were people who were just out to do the right thing. And I think at the end of the day, you to see people struggling with what the right thing is, but yet coming from a noble place and coming from a virtuous place, but not being able to find a clear answer, those to me are the most interesting kind of stories that I can latch on to. I, I, I get a little weary of... Oh, this guy's a murderer and a drug addict and all this, and I'm supposed to sympathize with him. It's at a certain point. It's just I'm just watching terrible people do terrible things. It does wear you down a little bit. Um, you know, it's, it's it's I love The Handmaid's Tale, but at a certain point, I start to get tired of this girl getting kicked around. It's just I read not, the book. I, I couldn't bring myself yeah, to watch. Yeah, Have you it, seen Fleabag? I haven't seen Fleabag. Uh, it's really, really good, but in the beginning, it's just hard because they're just uh, so many bad things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But bad it's, people. but it is, it is. I mean, that's the most fun stuff to write is those stories that don't have a clear cut, and that's what we're always looking for on the Orville. Those stories that don't have a clear cut, what's right and what's wrong, and you know, things that, things that, um, you know, where you have to weigh the rights of the individual against the needs of the society. It's all interesting stuff, and it's all stuff that that science fiction is is arguably more equipped than any genre to to address. And I I have a blast writing those kinds of stories. We had the thought while watching some uh, superhero movie that like every superhero movie is a trolley problem. Basically, it's like the choice between you know being nice to my friend who I know or saving the universe. Yeah, and. It, 
of course, because it's a superhero movie, they usually figure out how to do both. Yeah. But these are these are the real dilemmas, and and yeah. they can be played out in an infinite number of different ways. Yeah, it, it's 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 fun to leave that stuff. I mean, look, th- there are certain stories where you it's it is clear like this this is right and this is wrong. You may disagree with me, but I'm pretty confident in my ethics. I find that a lot of what we do on the Orville uh, is, is we 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 struggle along with the characters. It's it's a tough thing to to uh, you know. I mean, that story is a good example. This this is this is their society, um, but what they're doing is really fucked up. And I mean, look. I mean, it's it's it, Saudi Arabia is like a perfect example. It's it's their culture, but you know, look how they treat women. At a yeah, I mean, point, I'm not at personally. Certain point, when do you walk in there and say, "Hey, you're going to stop doing this, and you're going to start doing things this way"? Um, you know, people have differing opinions. I, I happen to believe that in in that scenario, uh, th- th- there is an argument to be made for being a little bit of a hero and and uh, helping out the the oppressed. Um, but not everyone agrees with that. Some people would say it's their culture. It's not your business. Um, yeah, I, I'm on your side in the sense I do think that sometimes you're going to try to intervene. Um, yeah. But I certainly historically recognize that there's plenty of times when societies have talked themselves into the idea that they were the virtuous ones. And in yeah. fact, they were just imposing their own yep. views, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> We've had crusades and colonies oh, yeah. and, and the whole bit. Um, did you get pushback from that episode uh, by people who have interests one way or the other in gender reassignment or gender identity? We we didn't. We um, no, certainly not from the company. I mean, it, what's interesting about Fox is is for all of their uh, conservatism on the news side, I've never once been censored in any way when anything that I've done. I, I, I will I will say that for them. Um, and uh, you know, when the episode aired, th- there was there were there were mixed reactions and. And there was a lot of passionate things written about the story. And, um, you know, again, there were some things that I read that educated me a little bit and some things that I thought were were a little bit um, uh, maybe not so correct in their analysis of the, of the show. But uh, it, it's, you know, overall, the, the reaction that I found to that show, and it was gratifying, was that, hey, at least somebody's talking about mm. this on uh you know on a network yeah yeah and you'll reach a different set of audiences than the ones that are very passionate on twitter yeah about those things right well sexuality is definitely going to be an area where science fiction can talk about things that are a little out there and and you've done it right you've had your human characters have sex with with androids or with robots with uh gelatinous blobs Mm -hmm. (laughs) um Mm -hmm. and you know some of that was very brave like the 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 scene where claire was having uh sex with a gelatinous blob yeah that's never gonna leave my brain (laughs) Yeah, that 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 was uh, yeah. I mean, again, God bless Penny, man. She's like, <laughs> she's just, she's she's game for whatever you throw at her. And I think that it makes the audience think about like, if if I do find this icky, why do I find this icky? Is that is that something yeah. you're intentionally going for? Or? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a it, there's there there there's no right way to answer that. I mean, it's it's um. You know, do I find this icky? Would I want to have sex with a gelatinous blob? Probably not, and that's okay. <laughs> um, a gelatinous blob played by Norm Macdonald. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's it, it it leaves the door open for interpretation in a lot of cases. But in contrast, when uh, she fell in love with Isaac, the mm-hmm. robot, it was not played for laughs in any way. Right? It was actually right. very tender. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, this you know the idea of, of the artificial intelligence that's that's trying to understand and trying to communicate i mean that's always that's a classic it's a classic because it's it's convert it's both uh warm and fuzzy and and funny there's a lot of different colors that that you can play with with a character like that like those the the, the non-human characters trying to grasp um human culture is always a a great and it's always a rich source of sci-fi writing but yeah i mean i you know to me I don't know. I thought, why not? I mean, if uh, at a certain point it's reasonable to assume that an artificial intelligence is going to re- reach the point where it achieves consciousness, I would think. Um, maybe it's happened already. I don't know. But 
uh, presumably at some point, that's that's not a, a crazy thing to to think will happen. And and so, what you know is that off limits? Like if I mean he's he's a person. Well, we're we're getting there. I mean, there's you know the sex robots are definitely coming, and then the sex robots will be easier than love interest robots. Yeah. But they're going to happen, <laughs> sure. And then, of course, the question of, of rights. I mean, you know, it's like you can't really have a sex robot that's sentient. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that yeah, would yeah. Not be, <laughs> that would not be moral. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's uh, it, yeah, that, that story was interesting because it's, I don't know, I, in that I just wanted to tell sort of a classic Hollywood love story that ended with Singing in the Rain. And, <laughs> and um, you know, these two very, very different people who, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the version of emotion from somebody who can't feel. Right. And the best example of that that I can think of was was Alan J. Lerner's solution to Pygmalion when he was writing the lyrics for My Fair Lady, is that song, I've grown accustomed to her face. Oh. It's like that was <laughs> that was his solution to a love song that's not a love song because Henry Higgins was not a this was not an emotional character. I mean yeah. not not in that way. He was very you know a lot of histrionics, but he wasn't he was he was very cold and unfeeling and so it made no sense for this guy to sing a love song so what he latched on to is that he had just become used to her presence and that was I, I took a little bit of that and applied it to Isaac in trying to determine what it is about him that would fit with his machine mentality but would still uh, would, would still acknowledge her absence from his life we can't really help but tell these stories from a human centric yeah. point of view. It's very hard to, it's very hard to, you know, cause your audience is human. Yeah, they are mostly human and they're gonna, <laughs> they're mostly, <human. laughs> they're mostly human. And therefore there will always be this hint or this implication that, you know, the emotionless robot can learn something from us. Yeah. And maybe there hasn't been enough of, you know, us learning something from that. I completely agree. I, I it's funny when I used to watch the original Star Trek, I used to have that thought about Spock. I, there, there, there was always this, nagging thing in my head that would that, that screamed this this guy kind of has it figured out <laughs> like it seems like once is, every seven seems, years he goes crazy but okay like this society is a lot more peaceful than, <laughs> than what we, we developed have science on. and everything yeah but no i i think absolutely that's true i i think that's looking in a perfect world where the terminator doesn't come true you do reach a point where um you know in, in the distant or not so distant future if if artificial intelligence is an element that's a day-to-day -day part of our lives that we do learn from each other. So you also talked about religion on the show, right? You have the Krill who uh, are highly religious, uh, basically religious fanatics, right? Um, do you, but it, it didn't seem like it was an element of the show, but it wasn't like yeah. an in-depth investigation of the pros and cons. Yeah, and in the third season, we're, we're expanding, we're, we're, we're broadening that culture a little bit so it's not just that one note it's it's um and i, I don't want to give anything away sure. but it's it, it is um it's it's an element that that I don't know, it's it's whenever i write the krill i have like I, there's always a different idea of who they are in 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 my head you know are the krill are they are they terrorists are they us are they there's, there's always there's <laughs> always the I, I can never really figure out where it is they they land and, and, you know, they're always sort of a metaphor for something. Well, other than robots, uh, it, it seems implausible that an entire race of creatures would be evil. Yes, I agree. Right. Completely. So they're yeah. going to have good aspects. And, and that's and that's where that's where Talea is. I mean, Talea is one of my favorite characters that I mean, that, that Michaela McManus was, you know, came in to do a guest spot in this one episode. And she was so amazing that we just ended up you know, deciding this, this is going to be a character that we're going to see over and over. Um, but it's, it's she it's, was the Mocklin. Am I remembering correctly? She was the Krill who, the Krill woman who, um, who Gordon oh, and, uh, the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. And in the second season we brought her back. And again, those, that, that's another one of my favorite go-to sci-fi stories is the enemy mine idea where, where, um, you know, you, you, you look for that commonality in the, in the enemy and it's always there. It's yeah. always there. Um, almost always. I, I, 
probably Hitler didn't have it, but, <laughs> but for the most part, <laughs> Hitler it, had a mother. There, there is, yeah, there, there is, um, you know, there, there's a commonality. There's, there's, uh, I mean, that's the extreme version. Uh, you know, I do think that there's a, you know, when you sit down with conservatives, even hardcore conservatives, you do find that you have a lot more in common than, than you thought. I mean, nobody's, nobody's going into it wanting to be the bad guy. Everyone wants to believe that they're doing the right thing. And, and, uh, you know, that, that, I, that idea of, of, you know, no matter how, as you say, like, no matter how bad the race is, it's kind of irresistible that eventually you meet one that is, that turns out to be, you know, somebody that you can relate Surprise to. Surprise you in some way. Yeah, well, yeah. and going back to Twitter, I mean, one of the things about our current moment is we can demonize whole groups of other people because we hear about them all the time without interacting with them, right? Yeah, you know, exactly. They're somewhere else. Exactly. And so we can hold this cartoon of them in our brain. Yeah, yeah. And look, I, I think that happens. I think that's happening with, with um, I mean, look, Fox News made a whole career of that. I mean, that, that Fox News made a whole a brand of that, rather. It's, you, there was this article recently, like how Fox News destroyed my family. Did you see that one? I didn't see that. No. no. It's basically, you know, when I used to go home and my parents or whatever would have slightly uh, yeah. reactionary opinions, but we could talk. But now they think that all my friends are the devil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's 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 um, it's too oversimplified. I mean, look, F Fox News, there's there's no getting around that that network is is it, it's it's one of the the instigators one of the big some would say the biggest instigator of that kind of thinking i mean when when they you know when ailes started the network it was about storytelling it was creating heroes and villains mm -hmm. these are the good guys and these are the bad guys people want to see they, they want that simplistic uh narrative they, they were talented at telling those stories oh yeah oh yeah and they i mean they still are and it's and it's i, I mean as as destructive as it is you can see the formula. It's it's about it's about us and them. And you know, I, I never saw that from the other side until the emergence of social media. Yeah. And I mean, my God, you know, you, you make a mild observation and conservatives, liberals, I mean they'll they'll all come after you. So am I mistaken or is there I haven't seen any social media on the Orville. <laughs> um, has that gotten rid of in, in the future? It's oh oh on the show. Um, I was going to yeah, say like, our, show, our not... marketing people really aren't doing their job. Then <laughs> no, the other way around. I've um, seen the Orville on social media, not social media on the Orville. Yeah, you know, it's 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 something that was we felt was better addressed as something that is elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. Um, the social media episode in season one was a, was I think a much more effective use of of of. Uh, it's it's hard. I mean, there are certain things that are cultural things are really hard to depict in science fiction without looking silly um, <laughs> or looking dated five or years later. Or looking dated, right? yeah. I mean, technology is easy. Um, you know, the uniforms are easy, the ships are easy. But when you get into like, it, it, people ask me all the time, how come they never listen? How come the music that they listen to? How come the pop culture is always of our time? And I. I always have to say, have you ever heard future music in sci-fi that doesn't sound so fucking stupid? It's <laughs> there's no way you can't predict it. Right? You can't. If I could predict yeah. that, I'd be a billionaire in yeah. the music industry. Um, <laughs> so why not get a joke out of it? Right? Why yeah. Not well, it's, have it's, Billy Joel be there all the time. It's it's a, it's just it's just a sensible. You know, th th those are things that that are not. We're not there to do that job. That's for the futurists. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so I also like, you know, beyond big themes like social media, religion or whatever, uh, you've had some interesting episodes just about personal anxiety, Im imposter syndrome, roughly speaking. Um, John, I guess it was. We, we, we learn at some point he's actually super smart, mm -hmm. genius IQ, but has been hiding it yeah. in a way that, you know, many people can probably relate to. Mm -hmm. And is that, um, again, is that, where does that come from? Is that... Uh, personal experience on the writers or is it is there a mission to sort of tackle questions like that 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 beca that was sort of a uh it was a little simpler than that. i mean yeah Im Im look imposter syndrome is is i think a lot of people in hollywood feel it this this idea that you're you're 
a fraud and you're not really doing making anything great and we have that in academia too <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it, it's you know i i tend to look back at things that i've written or even things that i'm in the process of writing and and beat myself up and and uh you know somehow convince myself that i'm i'm just i should get out of the business and do something completely different <laughs> but that was that was more of a result of the need to give that character something more to do. I mean, it, it's, you have a helmsman and a navigator side by side, and we'd made this whole deal about Gordon being the best pilot in the fleet, and there's John sitting there's next to him. It, it's, compensating. It, the two of them are great together, but beyond that, we wanted him to have his own his own identity. I, I there, There's, you know, it was a little bit of a sacrifice because they're so good together that you no longer have them sitting next to each other, and you lose a little bit of that, but... Um, but what we gained was, uh, you know, a, a re- an identity for this character that really ended up, A, giving us a story and B, being the anchor for this kind of rogues gallery in engineering that, you know. This, 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 <laughs> it's a wild world down yeah, there yeah. In, the, in the engine room. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he's, you know, he's kind of the, the Steve Martin Roxanne character who's got to kind of corral the. <laughs> <laughs> the fire department. <laughs> well, that, I think it's very interesting for, you know, as an audience member, probably we attribute much too much intentionality and planning to everything that happens in the in the story, in the episodes. But in fact, sometimes like there's a problem and you have to fix it and that leads to new story options, right? Yeah, it, it's it, it's interesting reading. There's times when they've they've. They predict things well and they figure it out and they're, they're right that we have thought this out. I mean, you know, the Isaac Isaac turning on the crew was something that was in our minds from day one. So that was that was all, all part of the plan. But, you know, there are other things that I, I will read and I'll <laughs> react in such a way. <laughs> I'll say to myself, this this is. They we're, they think that we're way smarter than we are. Like, <laughs> is this there is way overthought? Either a danger or an opportunity to get ideas by reading other people's tweets. Yeah, I think I think that's. I mean, you you, you never want to be in a position where you're you're stealing something from somebody. But if but if somebody says something about the show, like, hey, boy, I'd love to see this, or I'd love to, you know, that that's all fair game. Hmm. That's all fair. That that's just that's just responding to your fans. Um, and and uh, yeah, I, I mean that's that's hearing what the audience wants. So I, I do I do pay attention to that stuff. You you've definitely been. It's a science fiction show, but you're also a science fan, right? For for its own sake, I think mm-hmm. the first time I saw you in person was uh, at the Science and Entertainment Exchange launch yeah. event. Yep. Yep. My wife Jennifer was the director of the Science Entertainment oh, Exchange. Fantastic. She was the first yeah. director. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, that's an, an organization that does a great amount of good here yeah, in town. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, so. How much do you care about the science of your science fictional universe? It's it, it it's important. Well, look, I have to acknowledge that. I mean, the whole reason the Science and Entertainment Exchange was created, to to my knowledge, is is that so many people get their science from fiction. They get their science. They get their medical science from their law know, from ER law and order, yeah. Gray's Anatomy, and they they <laughs> they get their their law from you know CSI or whatever. Law and order, but so there, I think there is a responsibility to to be right. Um, I mean, you know, Andre is uh, Andre been doing this for years. Yeah. Andre Bermanis has been doing this for years. I if if there's something that I'm hazy on, you know, I'll pick up the phone and call you know Neil deGrasse Tyson or or you know, I mean, in many cases, it, it I walk across the hall to Annie Druyan's office who works on Cosmos and not technically a scientist, but my God, she. Sure, talks like one, um, <laughs> and uh, and you know you you do try to do your. I mean, my God, I, I was in a I was in a session with my psychiatrist, and and I I stopped <laughs> stopped in the middle to take some notes about a story <laughs> that like let me ask you this: if an alien did this, and he came in here and he sat down on this couch, how would you react? And <clears throat> you know, so or if I'm if I'm at a you know, I go for my annual physical and I have a, a medical question that relates to a story we're telling. I, I do try to get it from the right sources. Uh, you, you, you can, you know, time will only allow so much of that, but you do try to be responsible. If it's something that's a story that's just too damn good that requires us to stretch it a little bit, then we we will. But but where where it's feasible, we do try to be scientifically responsible. Yeah, I'm a big believer that the science serves the story in a fictional 
you know, fictional environment. You, the science should be of the form that it makes you not go, oh, that wouldn't happen. Well, it, ca- it can't ever feel like magic. And there's, there's one area that, you know, Brandon Bragg and I have talked about this. There's one area that we both struggle with when we're, when we're writing aliens is that the idea of a, you know, the super strength from a planet with high gravity, like, you know, that, that I can, I can get on board with that. The one that, <laughs> the one that I always struggle with is telepaths. Ah. That's the one that always, I can never wrap my brain around how that doesn't feel like magic. Right. How it doesn't feel like basically, you're basically writing a psychic. Um, if you employ technology into the mix, then I start to kind of see it. But, but you don't even have a teleporter machine, a transporter machine. We don't. Was that, was that a conscious decision? It was a conscious decision um, for two reasons. You know, one, one that it's obviously so emblematic of Star Trek. But two, if you if you study the science of it, I mean, you know this. I do, but go you're, ahead. You're, you're killing yourself, <laughs> <laughs> basically. You're not the same person. If when, you're not the same person. Yeah. You're, you're, you yeah, are, you are committing you. suicide and being reformed as a copy. And that bothers and, you? <laughs> um, it just it just seems just seems like just dystopian enough right. that it didn't need to be. The shuttles do just fine. Yeah, you can shuttle <laughs> people around. It's actually it and a it's, little bit more dramatic. It's it's thing. you get cool shots. The orchestra gets to chime in. I mean, you know, obviously, in the '60s they did that because it was it saved money. Yeah, but right. now you, you can show shuttle. you can show the ships leaving. I mean, those shots of the shuttle leaving the bay. It's 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 they're nice, and it's like it it makes the world seem real. And this is a you know, this is a big deal when we launch one of these things. We're going down to a planet, and isn't that fun? <laughs> <laughs> I do have to ask, though, about time travel, right? We've introduced mm-hmm. time travel in the last few episodes yep. of season two. Um, there, As soon as you allow yourself time travel, there's a million choices you need to yes. make storytelling-wise. Yes. So were there a lot of arguments or <laughs> discussions in the in the room about that? It's it's uh, We recognize we're opening a can of worms. It's surprising how many fans of sci-fi – do you have an aversion to time travel? They just really don't want you going there. It's a it's a dangerous mixture. It's a dangerous mixture. It's it's always to me. It's always fun. Like I, I I'm a big fan of time travel stories. I'm a big fan. I loved that um, 112263 that Stephen King book oh, about never the JFK yeah, assassination. Yeah. I, I I was loved it. Um, you know, I mean, you 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 need only look as far as Back to the Future to recognize the narrative value that time travel <laughs> serves in fiction it's it's you just have to be careful you just have to be careful of i mean it's a lot to think about and i think we I think we filled all the holes in that story but i'm not sure well did you see uh, avengers endgame i haven't so there's a line in there where I Paul have to find, I have to find six hours out of my life yeah that's true uh where he says wait you because there's time travel in there and yeah. he goes wait you mean Back to the Future was just bullshit. <laughs> and, I, and I think that might be partly my fault. I was an uh, advisor on Endgame and uh, and I explained in detail why Back to the Future was bullshit to the, <laughs> to the writers. <laughs> because Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot. I mean, all the, all the paradoxes in Back to the Future are, are undeniable. Well, um, there's it's paradoxes. Also I get that. What would really I cannot stand in Back to the Future, you know, it's a brilliant movie like as yep. cinema. It's fine. Wonderful. But, you know, Michael J. Fox does something in the past. And then in real time, we see photographs changing in the present. Yeah. Well, How does see, it know? Did you ever, see, did you ever see Frequency? Uh, I don't, a Dennis Quaid movie where he cuts no, off, he cuts off the guy's hand in the past and then in the future the guy watches his hand disappear oh i didn't see that like, looper has the same thing yeah it's, it's a, a little silly thing yeah it's it's, it's, silly. it's more than a little silly but <laughs> i think narratively yeah as far as i could tell it's uh, really hard to consistent. tell stories though with i mean there was an episode of star trek that did it very well called yesterday's enterprise that was a everything changed instantly and mm. and and that was you you were just in the new timeline and that was it Science wise, it's all actually bullshit, though. And just, Is it? Just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's not what would happen. Even if time travel were possible, that's not what would happen. The, what would happen? The most sensible way to have time travel is you can travel the past, but you cannot change it. But, oh, that's interesting. So that's, I mean, that's sort of what Stephen King used yeah. in his book. But so, so certain elements of the universe presumably seeming as if they are. The laws of physics would forbid it. That's right. In some fashion. Like you the can, tree would fall. Before you, so you, so you, that's really it is. Yeah, I think I think that there's. Uh, I've actually 
made small efforts to make this happen. I think there's a wonderful TV show to be made about a time traveling detective yeah. who can go back and learn things about the past, but not change it. And mm. it's sometimes, you know, there's a murder or whatever. You would really, really want to change it. But literally, you know, you can't. And therefore, if you tried. So how, but how would that manifest itself? Well, you don't know ahead of time. All you know is that you will fail. Right. So if you try to change the past, there's a danger that, you know, you'll get killed or something like that because, you know, it won't succeed because it didn't happen that way. But does, it, does that make the universe seem almost like a conscious entity that's out to. It just means that there are laws of physics yeah. that we're yeah. all obeying. Right. Uh, and and uh, so when I try to pitch this, people are like, well, it's not interesting if you can't change the past. I'm like, well, CSI is interesting. Like detective yeah. shows are interesting. They can't change the past. You yeah. just learn things about it. And if you were yeah, there, you yeah. would learn it in a much more dramatic way. So, okay, um, but 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 even just by visiting the past, aren't you changing the past? And re- if we're really no, talking, if we're, if we're talking there. about the butterfly effect, you were always you there. were always there. That's the point. And they they put it well in Lost. Whatever happened, happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you went there, uh, I mean, Heinlein tells the story where a character is his own mother and father, <laughs> right? Yeah. But everything's completely consistent. That's, that's an interesting story that, that that's so funny. We were playing with something like that last season and that's always an interesting story, but that's a hard one to crack. Oh yeah. The oh. logic of that is always right. like, you got to get work your brain into pretzels. <laughs> but okay. But yeah, even that, I don't know how entertaining it is to watch. But. Yeah. The standard thing to do is to have multiple timelines, right? Yeah. That's what we talk about. And yeah. even maybe in quantum mechanics, that's actually plausible who no, no one really knows, but we do it anyway. But then here's the, the, I have a, not a science issue with that, but a moral issue with it. Like yeah. when you have, as, as we have had at the end of season two, a separate timeline and things are bad, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. So you send someone back to fix it. And now you're back on the good timeline. Yeah, yeah. Does that mean you just killed billions of people in the other timeline? Yeah. And ended probably, their lives? Probably. Yeah. Is that, you're the yeah. world's greatest monster. Yep. 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 <laughs> I mean, it's 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 that cold calculating the, the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. You made a better universe, <laughs> but there's a whole universe that you got rid of. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I mean, that's that's a, that's a very good point. I mean, I, th- I think I think that's where you 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 you're faced with a choice, and neither one is. I mean, look, that's those those are the again those are the best kinds of stories. It's like the choice where neither one is really ideal, but you have to you have to make a decision. No, I know. Um, and it's so much fun. Time travel. I get it. It's it's, it's, it's irresistible fun. Yeah, I mean, you get to put on the costumes. <laughs> but no, that yeah, that that is a that is an interesting uh, that's an interesting premise that it, it, the 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 universe will will protect itself Not at all you. costs. Yeah, that's right. Now, if, and in, in the case where you can change the past and fix the timeline, uh, probably this will just be ignored going forward. But won't there be a forever temptation ever whenever anything goes wrong to go to the past and fix yeah. it? <laughs> well, is, I mean, here's a, que- here's a question for the I, I'm not a scientist. It, I, I once read somewhere that time travel to the future is possible and time travel to the past is not. Yeah, that's basically true. Right. Yeah. I mean, the way I joke about it is yesterday I traveled 24 hours into the future and here I am. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but yeah. you move it one second per second. Yeah. You can, Einstein says you can go faster into the future, but you can never come back. Right, right, right. So. Um, well, then we don't have to worry about it. Brian Greene wrote a, a book called Icarus at the Edge of Time. He wrote a children's book. And uh, I was a little surprised that this counted as a children's book because, you know, Icarus is the spaceship traveled close to a black hole. And Icarus, a young child, was stranded near the black hole and then rejoined the rest of civilization later but because of time dilation hundreds of years had passed and all you know his family was dead and everything I'm like that's a pretty dark children's book yeah, that you've yeah, just, yeah. What, like what is the lesson we're learning here there. yeah <laughs> <laughs> what what uh, if 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 a if a sci-fi fan is 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 looking to expand their education as far as legitimate science what you've written a bunch of books yeah what's 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 like the first sean carroll I have a book coming out in September uh, called Something Deeply Hidden About the Many Worlds of Quantum Mechanics, You know about the idea, which I actually think is true, not science fiction, that when you observe a quantum system, uh, the world branches into multiple copies, in each of which you got a different outcome. And sadly, you can't talk to each other, right? The different, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, but... I could easily imagine science fiction scenarios that were just very slight variations on that theme where you could talk to each other or influence, right? Like you, make you, different you, choices. You're talking like parallel. Uh, They're parallel universes. Yeah. yeah. And like I say, I think this is actually real. I don't think that this is science yeah. fiction. 
and, we don't and know so, for sure. so they would have to be infinite, obviously, right? Because at least a very large number, not necessarily infinite. We don't know. Because everything is the same, except this water bottle is a little further to the right yeah. than that other universe. So in your body, for example, yeah. um, a, a nuclear decay happens 5,000 times a second. Mm. So that means in every, every one of those decays. That's why I've been so tired. I know. Every one of them makes a new universe. Right. So two to the 5,000 universes are created every second just because of you decaying. So that's not infinity, but it's a very large number yeah, yeah, <laughs> of universes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And there's an app on your iPhone where you can split the universe intentionally and then do different things depending on what the outcome was. Oh, well, that's great. So, yeah. So that's uh, <laughs> that's coming out in September. And, uh, yeah, I think the influence that science has on science fiction is a mixed bag. Right. Like it, it can easily ham, str- hamstrung you. Ham- yeah. Uh, hamstring you um but it can also inspire you yeah you know that's the big and it's interesting that's where i think hollywood is a little off track right now because i think there's a heavy heavy uh focus on on fear the the fear of science and the fear of science gone wrong um and a lot less of the potential i remember that kind of the 90s it was completely the opposite every sci-fi television series was about hey we figured this out i mean even the terrible show like sea quest <laughs> yeah like, oh, look at that they figured like, that out <laughs> um you know it was about it was about the positivity of it and the adventure and the striving and now it's just we all love the expanse but it's a little depressing sometimes yeah i mean it's it's it, we you, like you, you have to have that in in storytelling or or you just you really start to it just becomes a drag and that's well, kind of how it is right now. It's one like, of the great classic drag. sci-fi uh, themes was always competence, right? Like yeah. the, these people were super smart. They could yeah. solve puzzles. They're people and, you want to be like. Yeah. And I think that there's plenty of satisfying stories to be written about people doing good things sure. for good reasons. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. So I hear you have other things going on. We'll briefly mention those, right? Sure. You have an uh, <laughs> album coming out. Is that true? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. That's the, uh, yeah, once in a while that's out. You don't have to do this because my publicist told you. Well, yeah, just, <laughs> there might be people in the audience who care. They might be interested. Yes. Yeah, we have a, a handful of um, orchestral albums that we recorded at uh, Abbey Road that are out on uh, iTunes. That are uh, that are um, Abbey Road. That's exciting. I mean, that yeah, must be, yeah. It's it's uh, if you like. Well, I mean, uh, it's pressure, I guess. <laughs> if you like orchestral jazz, that's that's uh, it's a good place to look. Okay. Yeah. Very very good and. Uh, Congrats, Orville season three is going to yeah, happen, obviously. Yeah, Did, yeah. So are you, what stage of the process are you in now? We're in writing mode. We've, yeah. we've written about, uh, we've broken about five, we have our season pretty much mapped out. We've broken about five stories and we're deep in the writing. It's another 13 episode kind of thing? As of now, it's another 13, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the standard these days. Yeah, well, when it's... When I it's, was a child, it was 26 yeah, episodes I don't, for a year. Honestly, I don't know how they did that. I mean, I, I and granted, part of it is that television... The television viewer expects more now. They want, you know, cable and streaming have have made, as Rick Berman used to say, <laughs> made people relatively spoiled. Like they want it to look like a movie every week, yeah. and that's fine. But it just takes time, and it means you can't do as many. It, it, it like there, things don't move faster just because of technology. You still have to film actors doing things. Um, you still need, need those pieces in editing, and so uh, thir- thirteen is is usually. In production, I will say from my standpoint, 13 episodes in is usually when I start to come apart, when I start to kind of, <laughs> yeah, you know, stare at myself in the mirror and go, I don't know. I, I don't okay. know if I can go a second longer. <laughs> Inevitably, for the end of both our first two seasons, that was when I, I just hit the wall. And, and I have, awesome. I'm not in, in this very deeply, but I have this feeling that for features, there's often this feeling like we'll film a bunch of stuff and then make the movie by editing them together in the right way. Whereas well, for your for a weekly TV series, yeah, you better get you better know what you're doing ahead of time. I mean, look, honestly, that's that's a that happens on both in both television and movies. If you know, sometimes the director is it understands editing. Sometimes, I mean, to me, the best directors really have a sense of they they know enough to know that your editor is as much a director as you are. I mean, it's you, if you can shoot with an idea towards how you're going to edit this thing, you're a lot better off because I mean, also I, editors hate it when, when directors will say, <laughs> let the editor figure it out. Just give you all this stuff. Like they, they like, to, I mean, at least the ones that I've worked with, they, they like to have some sort of a sense that there's a, there is a vision that there is yeah. a, a, 
a shape to this and you're not just asking him to clean up your mess. Um, you know, John Kassar, who, who directed, uh, God, the lion's share of 24, um, is, uh, is our, uh, um, kind of main onset, uh, EP director for the Orville and he's I mean he's just a fantastic wow yeah sure. director when it comes to editing he just he, he just has it has it in his head and and you get into that edit bay and it's just all there so but as cool. someone who's been you've been on on both sides is there more discipline on the TV side just because of the scheduling not necessarily no? there's there's <laughs> there's some really great directors in television and some really bad directors in yeah. television and it's the same for film it's right. it's it's a and, and it's because it's God. I mean, when, when I directed Ted, I got on set and I I was I had I had no idea. I'd written a script. I kind of knew what I what I wanted this thing to look like. I'd worked years in animation, so I had some sense of you know scene composition and all that. But I was relatively green, and it occurred to me that there must be a lot of people like this who show up on set in the director's <laughs> chair and really don't belong there yet. Yeah. Um, I mean, I had to ask my my director of photography you know okay so what's a 50 50 what's an over and he's one well, over is when you have the back of one character and you see a piece of them and then here's the other character over here did you go to film school at so all? i did, did but but yeah. I, I mean i was i majored in you know it was a concentration in animation okay I see. um but even then i you know i just i i don't remember the hollywood terms right. being bandied about and uh and and it's and I think there's look I mean there's there's a lot of talent and there's a lot of fraudulence out there, <laughs> and you just ho you hope that you <laughs> get. You know, I've, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of talented directors, um, but there are uh, there there are some where the editor has to clean up the mess. Well, uh, we're all looking forward to season three. I'm very excited. Cool. When when is it premiere? Do we know? Uh, premieres. Uh, it's looking like fall of 2020. Oh, might be a little sooner. Okay, but, but yeah. It's, I know, it seems like a long time. It does, yes. <laughs> that, don't quote me on that. That's not in stone. No, no, I understand. It but, may be yeah. sooner, but it's, it's, okay. uh, that's, that's the last thing that I heard because it's, because it, we can't get it done in time with all the work this show takes. We can't get it done in time for, uh, January. Okay. And if right. you're on a network, it's either January or, or right. the fall. So it's yeah. a crazy town we live in mm -hmm. here. Yeah. A lot of fun things going on. All right. Seth McQuarrie, right, cool. thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks so much.